Wonderful. So, hey, welcome back, because it is the second one of this wonderful series uh, by the Digital Freedom Fund, Reigning in Big Tech, How Competition Law Can Help Protect Digital Rights. And um, I'm really super happy today that uh, we have had, after a flamboyant start last week, that uh, we're going to go deeper into the yes steps of competition law and understand uh, more about this, because... Um, Yes, it is uh, all about, um, well, we will see in a second, big tech, obviously, and uh, competition law. So a warm welcome again. I'm AC Coppens of The Catalyst, a boutique agency based in Berlin, working on science, innovation, and new technologies, how they shape the creative uh, uh, part of society, but also the work and uh, the philosophical and political aspects. And this is why we were kindly asked by the Digital Freedom Fund to host this brand new series well, not so brand new because it is the second one, but uh, we want to explore together how we can make a better use of competition law framework to protect digital rights. Um, indeed, there is a broader movement built around the awareness of increasing inequality and economic concentration, which has contributing to popularize the idea that competition law and policy may have a role to play. And that's, uh, that's why we have a debate um, around the goals, the purposes, how it works. And that's, this is more than uh, legit. And this is why we want to have a look, especially because of its increasing relevance uh, in the digital concentration times. And digital concentration, talking about concentration, I'm not only talking about the economy and the markets, but also our own concentration on devices. So this speaker series will approach different, different issues like why competition law can be relevant to users of digital devices, what is the recent German ruling on Facebook, what does it mean, um, maybe the discussion in the EU around the topic, what can be learned from previous cases, um, which future cases are coming up also. So much more and everything which is relating to curtailing platform power and make this know-how accessible is the goal of this series. So we will go beyond the expert spheres. And as I was saying last week already, I'm not an expert. And that's exactly maybe why I'm here to ask questions where you might also have answers already, but we want to make it clear for everyone. And remember later for the chat, especially those who are like me, maybe not lawyers who would like to ask questions, there are no stupid questions here. So now a couple of housekeeping rules very quickly. Be make sure, uh, make sure please that you are muted, that your camera is off for now. Maybe you will have it on later on in case you want to ask a question. So we encourage you to write your questions in the chat. And here the team of the Digital Freedom Fund will pick the questions that will be asked later on. And then I will call your names and ask you, do you want to be on camera maybe? So precise in your question, if you want to be live, please just write live and then I will say, oh, you want to be on camera, let's go. And then we will have the question to make this a little bit more, let's say, human, so to speak. And uh, also to make things more human, you can use the reaction buttons. You see them um, uh, down to your uh, menu next to the post stop uh, and the share screen and the leave. Don't leave, don't touch the leave button. Just go to the reaction. There is a little plus and then you can, you know, like, say hello, like, and whatever that is, make uh, yourself um, a scene. For those who have the gallery view, you can see the reaction of the, of the audience that way, which is a nice way. And um, yeah, I think uh, that's it. So you can write your questions in the chat whenever. So that's, you know, when, when you feel something, because we're going to go on. It is a very substantial uh, um, uh, discussion we will have. So we will go on. So don't forget your question. Put it in the chat, and then we will get back to it in the Q&A section, which is then at the end of the conversation I will have with our guest today. Yes, and our guest today for this wonderful discussion, how competition law can help protect digital rights reigning in big tech. Well, don't need to tell you, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Microsoft, they wield unprecedented power. And many people fear, not only the lawyers, that they control people's most personal data, distort democracy, hamper innovation, and so forth. 
and around the world, a lot of competition authorities are investigating this. So in this discussion, we want to see what happened with big tech. How do tech giants typically justify their conduct in the face of such uh, criticism and fears? And ultimately, if competition law is failing us right now, or should it play a new role, more effective possibly in the digital economy specifically? And our guest today, I'm really enthused to have him with us. I must say, the speakers invited in this uh, row uh, is uh, fantastic, uh, fantastic uh, quality and expertise we, we're going to share together here. Dr. Konstantinos Stiliano, he's a professor in competition law and regulation, and he's a deputy director of the Center for Business Law and Practice at the University of Leeds School of Law. He has a different uh, areas of focus, um, of course, law and policy of digital markets, blockchain and communications networks. And he has a specific expertise also in um, cryptocurrencies, telecommunications, regulations and Internet. So just perfect for us. He has worked on numerous projects funded by the Euro European Union, the Swedish Competition Authority, but also Google, Facebook, um, the Thailand's National Bro Broadcasting and Telecommunications Commission. He has been a member of the Lawmaking Commission for the Modernization of Competition Law in Greece. It was this year. And uh, he has degrees of universities of Pennsylvania, Harvard University. He has been a visiting scholar at Uni Oxford University. So again, like our speakers la la last week, a fantastic track record. So I'm enthused and I would say, Constantinos, let's go into this discussion. I would like to structure it in three parts. First, we will have some basics, basic stuff around te tech giants and competition law. And then we will go deeper into abuse of dominance in the digital market. And then we will broaden the discussion to emerging digital markets and the future of competition law. So let's start bold, Constantinos, with a bold question. Is bold or is big uh, bad? Um, it is a popular observation when it comes to online or digital platform that big is bad. Is big bad? And how do they uh, defend their size? And tell us more about this, please. Sure. Um, thank you, AC. Um, we did start bold. The introduction that you gave me was quite bold. I've never been described as uh, fantastic, but uh, I'll take it. Um, thank you for um, organizing this, this. Thank you for putting it together. Um, this is a fantastic event series. I'm really happy to be here. Um, really happy to um, find out more about what uh, the Digital Freedom Fund is, uh, is, is doing. So um, again, very much um, appreciated. And thank you to everyone else who is um, joining us um, today. Um, I'll try to keep things um, easily accessible um, and understandable, but at the same time, I'm very much open to questions. So if anything remains unclear, more than happy to um, elaborate on it further. Now, well, uh, let me interrupt you very quickly also, because we have been preparing sources for you. So look at the chat. There are some links that will be pushed into the chat. And uh, Melissa, who was here a second ago uh, from my team, will be also um, um, animating uh, this chat while pushing the sources that Constantinos and the Digital Freedom Fund have been preparing for you. Sorry to interrupt you, Constantinos, but I wanted them to know it's really rich, immersive experience. Not a problem. Great. Um, again, thank you. So um, to your question, is, is, is big bad, um, which is a question that um, has, uh, has been coming up quite frequently over the past um, uh, couple of, uh, of years. I mean, traditionally, but now it's very much in the, in the foreground. And, uh, and regardless of the, um, uh, of the answer uh, to that, uh, competition authorities might, uh, might give to that, um, it's interesting to see what the tech giants themselves say about their own uh, size and whether it's bad. I mean, spoiler alert, they say it's not bad, but it's interesting to see what, what are the arguments uh, behind it. So let me just um, start by saying what in competition law is pretty much like a very, very fundamental axiom, which answers the question precisely because it exactly says big is not bad. We don't have a problem with bigness. It's not the size itself that matters to us. What we are concerned with is rather what we think 
size stands for. And, and what size usually stands for is market power. And the concern is what bigness enables companies to do. So this is why we so much focus on the tech giants. We are concerned that because of their size um, and how this is projected more generally in market power, we are concerned at how they might, we're not definitely saying that they do, but they might abuse that, um, that power. There is a very um, interesting um, quote from uh, a, a very famous uh, US antitrust case that uh, dates back to the 1940s, it's called Alcoa. And there the presiding judge said that the successful, com and I quote, the successful competitor having been urged to compete must not be turned upon when he wins. So the idea behind it is that um, if you become big and you deserve it, the fact that you're big per se is not a problem. So why are we concerned? We are concerned because, as I said, uh, being big is associated with everything that is bad about monopolies. And there is a long history of the things that we find are bad with monopolies. And the, the three main things with, um, that are bad with monopolies, we say, are higher prices, lower output, less innovation. But the comeback of tech giants is that we're nowhere close to, to that. Like you can call us monopolists as, as much as you want, but none of the traditional harms that we assign to monopoly apply to us. And they take them one by one and they can essentially, they essentially provide data to show that we're the good guys. We don't do any of the, uh, any of the harmful uh, effects of monopoly. Now, I'll demonstrate this very, very quickly if I can, uh, if I manage to share my, um, my screen. So um, starting from prices, the quite obvious defense um, is that our products are free. Now, of course, we know that their products are not free, but even if they are not completely free, um, the amount that we are getting for the price that we pay, and the price might come in different forms, including, for example, paying with our personal data, which is um, a, common, a, a common comeback, um, is very, very uh, low. So uh, we're not really jacking up any prices. We, instead, we're offering a lot of products for free. So there is that. So the, 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 the first downside of monopolies, we don't do that. Do we um, reduce um, output? And the answer is again, again um, no, we don't reduce um, output. If anything, people now have more access than ever before to more um, products. And if you look, for example, let's take um, Apple and, and Google, the traditional monopolists. If you look at the mobile phone shipments over the last uh, decade or so, you'll see that more and more people have access to uh, mobile phones. And if you look, for example, at the numbers, um, the number of apps that um, are being downloaded, if we say that apps is another pro relevant product in the in this whole ecosystem, we can get again see that um, the, uh, the output in the sense of like how much of something is consumed, produced and consumed is not, um, is not decreasing. Um, so output is also doing fine. So how about reductive innovation? And the thing is um, also they say on their side because um, if we have a look at what are the most innovative companies measured by the amount of uh, R&D they spend, the amount of money they spend in research and development, um, and I intentionally picked Wikipedia because it's supposed to be relatively neutral, you'll see that Amazon, Google, Microsoft, Intel, Apple, and a little further down, Facebook, they're all there. They are spending insane, insane amounts of money on research and innovation, which in turn is translated into um, new products and innovation and so on. Um, and again, if one said, once uh, one were to argue that the reason why they can spend so much money is because they have a, a massive amount of revenue, 
even if we look at it as a percentage of revenue, um, if you look at how much the uh, technology um, companies together with media and telco spend, they fare relatively high in, in terms of which industries um, spend more, um, more money in R&D per revenue. Um, mm -hmm. The last thing I want to I mention before I close um, the uh, is big, bad, and, and their defenses um, argument is that um, recently a lot has been said about uh, the, uh, the, the so-called killer acquisitions or the fact of rising concentration and and how they harm innovation by buying up small startups and small uh, competitors before they have a chance to become real um, threats. And um, Facebook was uh, was um, was grilled over this point a few months ago in the um, in the when the House uh, of Commons in the sorry the. Um, the, the the house in the in the United States of representatives um, had a, uh, a deposition and they uh, shared extracts of what Facebook said about the potential for Instagram to become a competitor um, and they snapped it up pretty quickly before it has a chance it had a, a chance to do so so the concern is that less and less money goes into startups fewer startups can compete and so on but again they point to very healthy, um, uh, very healthy numbers in terms of um, how the community is doing. And this chart combines a lot of information about uh, startups, including how much money is poured um, into startups from venture capitals. It's the blue bars. And as you can see uh, from say 2013 to 2020, um, it has been increasing. And the number of startup firms um, is also either increasing or slightly decreasing, but not to the extent that they attributed to large um, firms. So all in all, when we ask them, is big bad? Their answer is not only is, is, is it not bad, it actually turns out to be very much in the favor of consumers. This is interesting because um, if consumer welfare is the, let's say, ultimate objective of competition law. Is it actually? You have to tell me, but how can then tech giants claim they protect it when they drive out competitors from the market? Right, okay, so, so th this, is, this is interesting because, I mean, in a way it goes to the very heart of what competition law is supposed to, um, to do. And you ask 10 people, you're gonna get 11 opinions on, on that. And, you mean Roughly, lawyers? And especially law with lawyers, you're going to get 100. Um, <laughs> but, but you ask two people, a representative people from the two sides of the Atlantic, let's say the European Union and the US as the most, the biggest and the most influential jurisdictions um, um, in the world in terms of antitrust and competition law enforcement. And you'll get two slightly different answers. And the European Union is going to tell you, we protect the process of competition. And the US is gonna tell you, we protect consumers. And of the two, it's pretty evident to anyone who follows um, uh, competition law enforcement that the European Union has been a lot more active. So it seems like protecting the process of competition needs a little more um, support and a little more um, an enforcement than, uh, than protecting consumers, because as we just said, Turns out that all these tech giants, everything they do is in the benefit of consumers. But the reason why the European Union has this different stance is precisely because of a faith that through the process, we will get the best deal, protect the process of competition, allow competition to do its job, and ultimately everything else will follow. We will get the lower prices. We will get the higher output. We will get more innovation, but all of that is subject to, um, the, uh, to ensuring that competition actually works. Now in the US, they see it slightly different and they say, as long as the outcome that I care about is fine, then I'm good. I don't particularly care about how we get there. Now, there is some merit in that, in the sense that it's very, it's a little tricky to say that we protect competition for the sake of competition. And the reason for that is that we don't exactly know what we are protecting and we don't know where to when to stop. 
So if someone told you, would you rather have only one company that, however, provides fantastic products or have two competing companies that because they don't reach a certain size that allows them to um, take full advantage of, say, economies of scale or um, raise enough capital to make the necessary investments, they seem to be providing subpar products. And it's a very difficult answer to, to give whether the trust in the process will actually result in what we want or whether we should focus directly on, um, on the outcome. Yeah. And, and this is an impossible question to, uh, to answer, to be honest. <laughs> Good. Okay. That, that's a lawyer answer. That's for sure. But in any case, let's dig now further in our second step into uh, abuse of dominance in the digital market. So um, for those of us who are new to the subject, could you please maybe redefine abuse of dominance and maybe illustrate with a couple of examples? Um, um, sure. So um, abuse of dominance is what we call in Europe uh, mono is is the European equivalent of what they call in the US monopolization. Okay. Um, so abuse of dominance or monopolization basically means that a company that has a dominant position in the market, so a very large market power essentially, um, does not engage in what the European Union calls normal competition, right? Which is kind of like tautological because how do you define something with something else that itself needs definition? So what is normal competition? And to cut the long story short, because this is not a competition law module, the idea is that as long as you engage on, in competition on the merits, as long as what you do is based on business acumen uh, rather than on exploiting competitors or consumers in the market uh, or driving them out of the market. Um, so as long as it's on the merits, as long as it's... Um, Uh, efficient, as long as it promotes progress and innovation and so on, um, then it's good. Once you step away and the farther away you are from that, it might be abusive. Mm -hmm. And do you believe that um, these existing competition law frames around abuse of dominance actually are um, completely applicable to digital markets. I mean, we had that question last week with uh, Neve uh, Dan, um, where we were talking about this, like, oh, can we apply this actually in the same way? Oh, no, it doesn't work exactly the same way. So what is your, your take on that one? Do you believe that uh, it is um, applying neatly to digital markets? Um, okay, so a good question. And, and I think the answer to that is, um, is kind of like always yes, but needs improvement. Um, and, and, and I say yes, because the, the, the structure of how we approach competition um, laws and enforcement is, is doing all right. What do we do? We define markets uh, first to set the scope of the investigation, and then we measure market power, and then we try to see if they abuse the market power. And this kind of like analytical framework uh, in itself, it, it's not bad. Now, of course, along every step of those um, of this framework, how do you define the market in digital markets? How do you measure market power? Um, how can you tell with certainty what is abusive and what is not? Now, mm -hmm. all of those elements need a little bit of uh, fine tuning and a lot has been written um, on it. And I don't, I don't want to go into too much detail in terms of like how exactly we can improve that kind of like structural framework because I think there is something a little more interesting um, in, in that framework. And, and that part is that even if we could fine tune it to make it perfectly applicable in, in digital markets, the same way that it was, let's say, more applicable or more suited 50 or 100 years ago when the first competition laws emerged. And so let's say that when they were enacted, they were in better touch with the industry. Um, there are still some problems that we need to work on. And, and I think that a lot of competition authorities are in the right direction, but um, this is where we should be focusing on. And one of them is that competition law enforcement takes an awful lot of time. Most of the cases that uh, hit the headlines, like the Google search case and the Google Android case, and now the case in the United States against uh, Google, um, and there have been other cases in the past, most of them from beginning to end, so from the moment that the investigation will begin to the moment that the case will become final, 
they might take up like more than a decade. Now imagine in regular markets, if a decade is a long time, imagine how digital markets looked back in say 2009. So it's an insane amount of time to allow to pass between the identification of the problem and the remedies. The second problem is the remedies. It's like in most cases, remedies in competition law used to be, or at least many of them used to be a fine. Now, the problem with companies like Google and Apple, when you're a trillion dollar company, a fine in the range of five billion is nothing. I remember I was checking Google's um, market capitalization when the Google um, shopping case came out and the market share when the, the case outcome was announced dipped maybe 3% on that day. It was up by 6% by the end of the week. So it does nothing to their, um, to their finances. Um, it does nothing to their reputation. It's very, very hard to basically discipline companies like that with fines, no matter how big they are. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is that once this decision, th these decisions come out, uh, sorry, I, I just wanted to also mention that because of this, a lot of authorities now um, gravitate towards behavioral uh, remedies, which is not here is a fine that you need to pay, but rather you need to change your behavior in the market. Now, the problem with that, which brings me to my third point, is that quite often this is very vague. They say in the decision, you need to stop this conduct, but they don't say how. They don't say what exactly you're supposed to do. And so the way these companies implement it is not necessarily um, I I compliant. And unless the competition authorities then follow up and say you didn't fully comply then and, and, and impose further finance, uh, financial uh, sanctions and so on, then this is kind of like a dead end. So um, the Google Android case and the Google shopping cases both have been very heavily criticized because um, the Google shopping case, the comparison, uh, the comparison shopping websites, they said we had 1% more uh, traffic after the decision. That's nothing. The decision did nothing to us. Um, so basically it was useless. Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult to design appropriate remedies and to implement them and follow up with them. Okay, so basically it means um, we need to see maybe if we do more for the digital markets, if we have more specific answers for the digital market. And so, because basically if, if existing frameworks are not enough for the digital markets, um, because they do not fit exactly, and then it takes time, and there will be a lot of questions, as you were saying, um, how can they be amended and what is, what is done for, for this uh, uh, currently? And why do tech giants, for example, fall through the cracks of competition enforcement, so to speak? I mean, this is actually revolting when we are, I mean, I'm, I'm working in the tech uh, thing and I'm thinking like, normally everything is so fast and, you know, like, and the tech uh, people are trying also to react fast and to take some opportunities, right? So if, the competition law enforcement is not enough. They will find the crack, right? Right. Um, no, that's a that, that's a that's a great point. And 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 all of the um, all of the ways that we have devised so far, how exactly to fine tune what is a market definition, how to move from financial sanctions to behavioral remedies, how to speed up the process through perhaps. Um, greater use of interim measures. We don't have to wait all 10 years. Let's impose interim measures first and then um, see what happens. So all of these are sort of like incremental um, solutions. But if you're asking me, I think what has become abundantly clear in the last decade is that, let me back up one step. We used to say that competition law is a surgical tool, meaning that the, the reason why, why we use competition law is when we find that a single company has done something wrong, we go after that company, we tell it to stop that particular behavior. That's all great. But what happens when all the companies in a certain market behave in a bad way? What happens when we have a problem with Apple, Facebook, Google, Amazon, Intel, Tesla, whatever other company you want to put in the, in the digital markets basket. Now that means that it's not the company that is a problem. 
it's the market that is a problem. And when we move from a company problem to a market-wide problem, then we need to move to something that is a little more regulatory in nature. Because regulation, by definition, is not a surgical tool, is a general applicability tool. It says, here's the rule, everyone needs to follow it. And so one thing that, and I am sharing one of my favorite cartoons on that uh, in the chat. So uh, if you're asking me, one of the things that we should be doing is use competition law, not as a tool that comes into play, into play um, against one particular company after something has happened, but rather as a tool that can devise rules that we can, um, that we can use before um, we get to a situation where market has already been severely abused over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that we need to be using more regulation rather than just exposed competition. Now, this particular cartoon, let me just close with that, is a little more insightful than it appears at first, uh, at first glance, because in the, in the sadomasochistic relationship between the dominatrix and what clearly is Mark Zuckerberg, um, there is a masochistic part, which is that the person invites regulation. They welcome regulation. And this is interesting because even though traditionally we say that companies don't want regulation, sometimes they do. And you know when they do want it, they know that they do want it when if they are regulated, and they do what the regulators say, then they think that antitrust laws will no longer apply to them because we are doing what the regulator asks us to do. What more do you want? Mm -hmm. So sometimes they use regulation and if they lobby well enough and hard enough, they can do that. They, um, if they use regulation as a way to get out of the, of the difficult position by say, regulate us, we'll do what you ask us to do, it's of course usually light touch or very difficult to implement. And then they'll say, this is a regulated market. We don't really have that much room for freedom anymore. We're doing what you told us, so get off our back. So this is why the, the brilliance in this, uh, in this cartoon, it's, it's the fact that yes, we need more regulation rather than just antitrust, but also sometimes they can even manipulate that. It's quite interesting. It's, it's super interesting. We have to uh, invite some psychologists on top of this now, <laughs> not only the lawyers. But um, okay, let, let us go into the more futuristic part of our discussion now. And let us see um, what's happening at the emerging digital market, because a lot of things, and you were saying it's a lot about the tech giants, which is happening right now. They are concentrating a lot about this. Are actually competition law and policy discussions too focused on the GAFAM, the Google, the Apple, the Five, and et cetera, et cetera? Are there maybe uh, new emerging digital markets in, in smaller sectors uh, appearing, startups, and et cetera, where the uh, anti competitive harms are much starter, starker, oh, stronger, sorry, um, or even more um, problematic? And we, we skip it because we're too focused on the GAFAM. Um, I mean, the, the answer that I was uh, that I would give is 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 probably no. Um, one thing that is clear, and and it became very clear to me when I was uh, working at the lawmaking uh, commission uh, earlier this year, is that um, competition authorities have very limited resources, so they mm -hmm. do need to prioritize which cases they pick. And 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 the thing is that if anything. These tech giants, they seem to affect their life and intermediate everything we do more and more compared to, say, five or ten years ago. So I'd say that to the extent that they seem to be um, very relevant, in, even more so relevant now than before in our everyday life, um, the focus is not unwarranted. Mm -hmm. um, what is interesting, however, is that instead of moving away the focus from certain companies, I think what, they, that of, what authorities need to anticipate and what competition alone needs to anticipate is emerging technologies and markets rather than players. And what, 
what I find quite interesting is that now a lot of those big companies are, are, are becoming entrants into what seems to be the next big frontier, which is financial technology markets. Um, so obviously all of us is familiar with online banking, which is offered by traditional banks. What we are seeing, and we are seeing it all the more so after the you know, uh, popularity explosion of blockchain and Bitcoin and all of that in the past 10 years, is that finance and financial products and services is becoming a lot more decentralized. It used to be the prerogative of banks. It's becoming now the prerogative of less regulated actors or even grassroots movements like Bitcoin. And so my understanding is that Google and Apple and all of those companies are not going to go away. If anything, they do want a share of that market and they will enter those markets and they will use their power to make sure that they become successful in those markets. But for, for authorities to be able to be proactive, what they need to do is understand those new, new markets first. And what strikes me as quite interesting in, say, blockchain is that it's like anyone who is familiar with either blockchain or with competition authority, with competition law, will have heard this a million times. We keep saying blockchain is so new, blockchain is so revolutionary. Well, it is and it isn't. But in, in when it comes to competition law, it does change a couple of things. For one thing, you know, we keep saying Facebook did this, Amazon did that. But when we say Bitcoin did this, who is Bitcoin? So it's it's quite difficult to say who is behind all these new market forces, uh, who do we go after? Are these even economic actors that competition law generally um, is concerned with? Or are they amateurish activity that just happen to have an impact on, um, on the market? Um, and even if we pass that um, hurdle, we're, stick, we're stuck with other things like, again, as, as we mentioned, market power, super central concept in competition law. But what is market power in in you know crypto assets and 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 you know uh, crypto coins like Bitcoin and stuff? Does Bitcoin have market power by market capitalization? Sure, compared to which um, other assets? If we compare it towards like the dollar, then no. If we compare it towards other crypto assets, then yes. But are these really substitutes? So. In order to be able to answer all of those questions, they need to familiarize themselves with the market. Um, and as you can see, it's not like these giants are moving away from those markets. Facebook was keen to enter it, and that's why they created Libra. And and <laughs> I right. remember I was I was at the OECD conference um, a year ago when the minister for finance in France, without any um, uh, any um, uh, pre-announcement or anything, they, uh, he took up the stage and said, in its current form, there is no way we are going to allow Libra to run on the market. And, and, and just like that, the whole Libra vision collapsed. And now, I mean, it's not like they abandoned it, but they significantly changed um, what it is. But one of the concerns is that this is going to be in competition with market forces that we've never before seen, like central banks. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm French, so I'm not going to go into this minister thing into it. But um, yeah, exactly. And especially because we have to do with decentralized protocols to give actually the power to different actors on the market, which sounds to be good, right? Um, it makes it still uh, much more complex. And I think you made this point very clear. So this is the future, definitely. And this is going to happen. So I wonder, how, of course, how long will it take? But I think I, that we have a couple of questions coming up. And I, to be honest, I don't know where to start with because it's uh, really great. I see two questions here directly in the chat of uh, Diana Bryson, Joanna Bryson, sorry. Is the issue here the fact that there are so few of them? In the time when I typed it, I, I thought maybe people would respond when I typed it at the other audience. Yeah, it, it was exactly when you made this comment, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, in fact, I, I almost tweeted it, but I was too interested. <laughs> <laughs> when, you were, when you were commenting that um, that this isn't the time for a surgical, a surgical strike because there's too many, it's more than one company. It's all the companies, but all the companies are like six. Mm -hmm. so, I, so I have two questions about that observation. 
One is when there's only six companies, they are, of course, able to coordinate and collude. We already know that Apple and Google did that with respect to non-poaching and things like that. So the question is, is this, have we created, and it's not, I don't think it's entirely their fault. It's, I think it's the nature of the digital, unless you do the great China, firewall of China, that you do have the, you know, this, this consolidation. But, um, but have we created a situation where, where there's like six powers and then is it more, is it maybe a little bit more like utilities and that we have to figure out how to handle the fact that, you, that, that them as a, as a sector, not just them as individuals. Um, and so that's, that's part of where I was going there. And then the other part I tried to go to is, I loved the question that I'm sorry that the host was asking about the, the rest of the companies. There's some great companies out there that are maybe even choosing not to have this kind of market cap strategy. And so the question is, is there a way that we can empower the rest of the sector? And if we did, would that somehow reduce the, the amount of damage that the top of the sector is creating? Right. Okay. Uh, fantastic questions, both. Um, and I'm kind of like torn between playing devil's advocate here. Um, um, yes, do also- it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, you could be both. You could be both the devil and the angel and talk to yourself. I'll, <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll be the schizophrenic one. Um, <laughs> six. Let me start by, 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 by saying the, like, the quite obvious grammatical interpretation. Six by definition is not a monopoly. Um, and, and there are markets that we haven't really touched very much, or at least they haven't attracted that much, that much scrutiny that were dominated by even fewer players. If you look at Intel and AMD microprocessors, for many years until like late 2009, we, didn't, we weren't particularly concerned um, uh, in, in that market. Coca-Cola and Pepsi. Boeing and um, Airbus, there are markets that because of whatever characteristics that they have, they tend to concentrate around um, a small number of of companies. This, someone could say, might be not because they are abusing uh, their power or because they are colluding, but it might be the nature of um, the market. There is a very interesting debate going on about the rising concentration um, across the board, not just the high tech markets, all markets. There have been a couple of like very influential papers um, that have been published over the last couple of years that prove that concentration is rising, particularly in the US. And one of the ways they measure it is by looking at the markup rates. So how much profit um, are you making? And, And this sounds very alarming. But if you look closer um, to the data, um, so w- one, thing, one way to undermine this is to say um, the data is wrong. And, and there are lots of other studies that prove quite the opposite. And one of the ones uh, one that I could share, or if you want to look it up, um, was issued actually by the European Central Bank on concentration rates. And it, it debunks several myths around it. And I'm mentioning I'm mentioning it because it's by the European Central Bank, so it has the veneer of neutrality um, in a way. Um, but uh, but what, what I was getting at is that the fact that they have higher margins doesn't necessarily mean that um, there is something wrong to be concerned with. It might mean that they're just becoming more productive. Having higher profits means perhaps that you're reducing your own costs rather than jacking up the the, the price. And it's very difficult to prove which one is the determining uh, factor. So let me just um, say that six might not be a terrible number. Follow on point uh, on the other thing that you said. Should we be treating them as utilities? Again, by definition, utility regulation was always concerned when the utility was a monopoly or when um, in the very early stages of liberalization of the market, when we thought that it's, it's very difficult to go from one to two, it's less difficult to go, to go from two to three, even less difficult to go from three and four and so on. Now, um, the utilities market still remain highly concentrated. And uh, it's been like about 30 years now that the telecom market, for example, has been liberalized. And you still see that in most countries, we only have like, say, three um, cell phone players. Why? Because again, the, the nature of the market by, might be such that only a certain number of players is, uh, is, is allowed in the market. Uh, they might be profitable. Um, 
however, and let me just say this, and then I see that um, you want to say something, um, but I'll leave it to the prerogative of AC as the moderator if they want to, um, to follow on. But let me ju just say this. Part of the regulation that I'm talking about is exactly on the last thing that you mentioned, which is, should we be finding ways to encourage startup creation? And the answer is yes. And let me go even farther. Black Friday is coming up. We should be encouraging ways to empower consumers. We, we seem to present um, the antitrust wars as between the government and tech giants and consumers are there just to be the winners of this war if it's done properly. Whereas we can actively take part. Don't shop from Amazon if you don't want to. I mean, like pay one more pound per product or wait one more day. You don't have to get your product tomorrow or don't have a Facebook profile if you're so concerned with the data. But like consumers need to do their part um, in this whole debate. And, and part of what competition authorities can do is educate them um, and, and ask them to be part of the solution rather than just present them as victims uh, the same way that companies present them as victims when they're regulated or when uh, competition enforcement turns against them. Very good. Yeah, there is indeed a note, not of Joanna, but of Elena Malikova in the chat. It is not a question, it's just a comment. I can read it very quickly. Your references relate to physical goods company that benefit from efficiencies in the tangible production facilities. So bigger can mean more efficient. Digital economy is less cost driven. We could relate to this. I think I would rather leave this because I have another question, uh, if I may, which is building on Joanna's uh, questions, which is about this surgical tool. You, because you explained a little bit earlier, we need more regulation rather than the surgical tool of competition law to deal with market-wide problems. So what kind of regulatory framework can, can be actually leveraged? Um, what kind of regulation comes actually to your mind actually for uh, to deal with these market-wide big tech problems. Okay, um, okay. so uh, both the comment and the question very, very fair. To the comment, I can just very quickly say that there are a lot of efficiencies that are associated with, um, with digital markets as well. It doesn't have to be a physical product. Um, and one of the interesting things uh, that transpired from the Google Android um, case, um, and one of the arguments, obviously, that uh, that, that, that Google advanced um, was that the fact that Google exercises such pervasive control um, over the whole Android ecosystem, similar to what Apple is doing, is because it wants to enhance the user experience. The fact that it controls the security aspects, the integration between different apps, the uh, smooth updates, um, keeping out viruses um, and, um, and and even the, the marketing and the arrangement um, and helping uh, phone manufacturers to, um, to, uh, to to know what to do with uh, with Android, all of those efficiencies were basically um, grounded on the fact that uh, Google has the power to um, effectuate them. So um, what I would say is that always take it with a pinch, a pinch of salt, but there are efficiencies in digital markets um, as well. Now, in terms of, uh, of regulation, uh, a very good point. I think we, we almost have the answer already. The European Union is, um, after 10 years um, of, well, six years, not 10 years, but like after six or seven years is finally unveiling the Digital Services um, Act, which a part of which is two new um, mechanisms to um, enhance um, competition uh, in, in the market. And one of them is, is a kind of like a very regulatory tool uh, by nature, which is it gives the right to um, competition authorities to run mar market investigations, so whole market, market-wide investigations, and if they perceive that there are structural problems in the market, take appropriate measures. Um, it doesn't specify what the measures um, need to be, but it could be, for example, impose a, uh, a data sharing obligation or impose a, um, a neutrality obligation so that these platforms uh, treat everyone equally or impose transparency obligations. Now, I'm not going to argue in favor or, or against uh, um, uh, mm -hmm. of any of those, but the idea that when the problem is systemic, 
um, you can apply certain measures and the brilliance of, of regulation is that you can customize it however you want. There is an underused um, regulatory concept which is called sunset clauses, which means um, come up with a, a, a regulatory measure but make it automatically, automatically expire after one year or after certain conditions in the market have been met. And the brilliance behind it is that you say, look, regulation is not as inflexible as we're used to thinking. It's just a temporary tool. But instead of having to go company after company in separate investigations, I just need to impose that tool across the board. It might be a little crude, um, but if I plan it uh, properly, if I design it properly, if I make it expire properly, um, it, it has the potential to solve these kind of like structural problems. Um, and the second, um, so uh, one is these market investigations. And the second um, um, tool that the European Union has come up with is, again, explicit regulation. The so-called gatekeepers, however the European Union will define them, we don't know yet. The final details are going to be unveiled in, in, in December. So the so-called uh, gatekeepers, they might incur additional obligations. And, 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 and most likely these will have to be non-discriminatory obligation. So you can't really kick out an app out of your store because it competes with one of your own uh, apps. Mm -hmm. I'm not taking a position as to whether this is like a good thing or a bad thing, and we need to carefully consider how to frame it. But I do think that it's a good idea that when everybody is doing the same thing in the market, then you need measures that apply to everybody. Oh. Yeah, and, 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 yes, sorry. Please, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 because I have a comment of uh, Joanna, which I've, I, I, and it is really joining what I wanted to say also. This is great. The thing is, if they do the same thing, but they could, they could pretend they don't. It's not like, as Joanna is saying, airlines and GPS are both very much like big tech in what their natural size of market is in the global. But the reason they are more than one airplane company and more than one GPS is a security decision to create artificial competition. I'm not sure right now that GAFA are really all competing with each other because we could also say, oh, um, Apple is selling phones, but me, Amazon, uh, I don't, or maybe differently, or we don't have exactly the same share of the market, or we are not into social media network, and actually we're still all in the same uh, ball, right? So um, it's interesting. Um, Can I make um, a final remark on this? Please, um, please. We would, we would need a whole different session to answer the question of whether these companies compete against each other. And let me tell you, defining the market um, in which the investigation will take place and in which we will identify competitors is one of the most hotly contested areas because if you define it broadly, you have more competitors coming in. If you define it narrowly, it means that you might actually be a monopolist in that market. Um, quite interestingly, in the... Um, in the Android case, in the European Union, uh, the European Union defined the market in a way that Android does not compete with iOS. Now, to pretty much anyone who has ever owned a smartphone, it seems to me that they would think that Android and iOS are direct competitors. The reasons why they did it, it's not a completely absurd decision to, to not uh, include it. And the reason why they did it is because Android is the only major operating system that can be licensed to other um, manufacturers, whereas Apple, the iOS system, is only open to Apple. Now, this is, a, this is an okay consideration, but it means that you're looking at the market only from one constituency, which one? the manufacturers of mobile phones, because in the eyes of the consumers, they are substitutable. It's only in the eyes of manufacturers of mobile phones that they're not substitutable. And even in the eyes of app developers, they are substitutable. So whether these companies compete with each other, um, it's a tricky thing. It, 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 it partly relates to who we are looking at, but it also partly relates to time. And um, in one of the articles that, um, that I wrote and you shared, uh, which is the exclusion uh, in digital markets article, um, which you shared in the, chart, in, in the chat, I have a nice table towards the end that basically shows the product and service markets that these companies 
have entered over the past 20, 30 years. And what you will notice is that they've entered several markets. And whether they compete with each other sometimes is a matter of like just time. Just give them a couple of years and they will enter that, uh, that market. Now, is that a good way to think about it? That's what they're arguing. But in the very end, what matters is do consumers, if we think that they are the ones that we care most about, have actual choice? And I'll finish with this. Even when we look at consumers and even when Android and Apple are considered to be substitutable, that's not the end. Because what the commission found um, in, in different data and what the US investigation found is that most people are unlikely to switch between Android and iPhone. Once you're in, in an ecosystem, you're, you're, nobody forces you to stay in the ecosystem, but the market dynamics are such that it's very difficult to leave that ecosystem. So sure, they compete, but then again, do they really? And I'm just putting it out there. I don't want to take a position, but I'm just I'm sharing the kind of like considerations that can be thrown from both sides um, to show how difficult um, this, uh, this kind of like debate is in determining who's right and who's wrong. And let me just, okay, this is This is, is why you're a lawyer, right? Sorry? This is why you're a lawyer, otherwise- No, exa exactly, <laughs> exactly. And this is why we work for one company one day and one company for the other day. But I mean, in a way I take pride in this kind of like arrangement because um, like, I mean, there is some truth in, in both sides. And the question is, you know, which truth is stronger at any, any given point and which harm is the, the, the worst that you want to protect, um, uh, to protect against. But let me just finish with, with one thing that goes back to an early point that I made, which is, do we protect con consumers or do we protect the process of competition? Now, I would be all in favor of protecting consumers because if you can get straight to the outcome, then great, why do you need it? Why, why did you care about the process? If the outcome looks okay, and that's, you know, that's what you, you, you're focusing on, then great. But the problem with focusing on consumers is that we often can't trust consumers because they're short-sighted. If I, if I give you a, a, a cheap product today, you're gonna buy it, even if I tell you, but what if, the competitors that are slightly more expensive disappear from the market and then the only company that is left in the market jacks up the price. As a consumer, how likely are you to care about this? It's very hard for us to be, to take like all the decisions in mind that all the, the factors in mind to decide what is best for the market. Um, and, and think about this next time we we think in, you know, as consumers and we think as, uh, as, as authorities and we think as companies, like, yeah. Exactly, and you spoke about this difference between the UK and Europe and the US approaches because of that. And I was actually, uh, uh, I wanted to, to ask this uh, very last uh, question. Do you think that, I mean, actually I know that we are six and I'm the chief time officer. And normally I should actually close the discussion, but I want to know in the chat, give me just a yes. Shall we have a couple of minutes more, please? Say just yes or make a wave or whatever in your uh, um, uh, reactions button. I'm going to gallery view and see that a lot of people. Well, yes, okay, yeah, we have one, two, well, three, four people. Can we give five? Yeah, well, give me more. Six, yes, seven, eight. Okay, no, we're going on. This is wonderful. So let's go on just for a couple of minutes, okay? Thank you very much for your feedback. So this is an interactive session indeed. And I wanted to ask you, because of the difference between the US um, uh, you were mentioning and, 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 and Europe, do you think that competition law has a role in dealing with this problem? Is this something that comp competition law itself should address? Oh, and by problem, you mean uh, whether they are supposed to protect competitors or uh, uh, protect... Pr pr because of the privacy problems that we have, that the consumers are maybe a little weak and you say, oh, this is cheap. And, but, you know, this product would be better, but it would be a little bit more expensive. But the consumer would say like, well, why should I buy something more expensive? Because I can't afford it and et cetera. So all these um, um, specific problems due to having this consumer uh, approach to protect the consumer perspective, do you think it is something that competition law should approach um, and take into account completely? Um, well, 
in, in a way, the answer has to be yes. Uh, I mean, competition law can never be made effective unless it, it decides for itself what it sets out to achieve. Like, what is its raison d'être since you're French? Sorry, I butchered it. Yes. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I should say that they almost never discuss it explicitly. Like, what are we supposed to be doing here? There are snippets here and there that say, we protect uh, competitors, we protect competition, we protect consumers and so on. I don't think that the comp that competition law can very clearly say, I'm gonna pick one goal and one goal only, and I'm always gonna go with that. I, I don't think that it, this, is, this is true because in, in different cases, you might need different theories of harm. You might have different types of evidence. You might have like different constituencies that are harmed. So to give you an example, in the, um, in the, um, in the Google shopping case in the European Union, the European Union never managed to prove harm to consumers. It kept saying that this has been harmful to consumers, but it never actually proved, proved harm to consumers. Now, legally speaking, and in terms of legal standards, it didn't have to. All it had to prove is that the conduct could harm consumers, but not that, not that in fact has harmed consumers. So it's very much concerned about consumers, but nowhere in the decision makes an effort to substantiate this particular um, claim. And this is a very big problem because it undermines trust in the system. It undermines what competition law is supposed to be doing. It would be much better if it said, look, what Google did is that it harmed competitors. All of the comparison shopping websites went out of the market because of what Google was doing. And this is what we care about. But then that would shift emphasis of the case, not about what consumers, um, how consumers were harmed, but how competitors were harmed and why we should care about that. And it's quite interesting that in the US case now that was um, opened, um, I think last month, again, against Google uh, search, they said the, the following very interesting thing. They said that um, Google keeps saying that we have traditionally had a very large um, a share of the market. Um, competition is one click away. The fact that consumers prefer to search with our search engine means that we are providing good results. And the, the, uh, and the Department of Justice said, we're not doubting that Google is good, but how do we know that we cannot have something better? How do we know that because of what Google is doing, Microsoft Bing could not now have been a better competitor? Now, this has a name. It's called the Nirvana fallacy. It means that you're complaining about something, not because it's bad, but because it's not better. And it's impossible to prove this hypothetical. It's impossible to say that if Google hadn't done this, then Microsoft would have been even better. And to me, this is very interesting because in the US, this might be very difficult to fly as a, as a theory of harm because they generally don't think like that. And I think the Department of Justice slipped up there by saying that um, our theory of harm is a hypothetical. Um, and I, I, I don't know how they're gonna argue this uh, in, in, in the end, but that was, that was a bit of a, of, of a slip up. But, the reason why I'm concerned is because Google has, in a way, if this is how the Department of Justice frames it, 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 it sets up Google for success. You know why? Because Google has all the data on its side to prove that you don't really need a lot of data to become a successful search engine. There is a lot of um, research in, um, in computer science that shows that going from um, 10 data points to 1,000 data points increases your results by this much. But going from uh, 1,000 data points to 10,000 does not increase it as much. Going from 10,000 to 100,000 does not increase it as much. And this is called like a diminishing marginal returns. Mm -hmm. And so Google has a, a very good uh, way to argue that it's not the lack of data that Microsoft uh, that, that prevents Microsoft from developing a good search engine. It's incompetence. 
And, and, and unfortunately, it's a very hard way for the Department of Justice to prove that the reason why they're bringing this case is because we could, in a utopia, have a better case. So um, to answer your question, it very much rests with competition law to decide what it seeks to achieve and pick the proper theory of harm and, and stick with it. They need to be able to say, whose harm I care about? How am I going to prove it? Here are the, re the relevant data. And a lot of competition cases collapse, not because there is not something there. I don't claim that Google is a, didn't do anything wrong in search or in Android, but the problem is that they focus on consumer, the protection of consumer, yet they never prove it. Mm -hmm. They focus on, um, we could have had something better, but that's an impossible theory of harm to prove. And I think that this is these are kind of like strategic errors on the side of competition authorities um, that if they if they had argued it differently, they would have had a better case and they would have protected consumers better. Can I end up? Can I end with one very minor point? Um, because yes. I see that there are still thirty four people in the room, as many as I know. As I know this is great. We are super happy. Extra time. I'll give you a concrete example of when I think that. Um, a competition authority um, did it properly. In the Microsoft case 20 years ago in the European Union, um, one of the concerns of the European Commission back then was that um, because of what Microsoft was doing, which was to uh, tie Windows Media Player with Windows, it was driving other competitors um, from the market. And primarily it was... Um, what was its name? Um, uh, ah, a real player. It was oh, real right. player. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone remembers this. Uh, people around my age will remember real player. It was a good player. Now, um, now to prove that um, that Microsoft, uh, because of the tying, excluded competitors from the market, including real player, that was relatively easy. You just look at the percentage of these companies. But how do you prove that that was bad for consumers? So uh, what the commission relied on back then is um, tests and rankings from popular PC and computer magazines back then that compared, and all of that was completely unrelated to the case. All of that preceded the case, but compared Windows Media Player to uh, other media players, including Real Player. And the commission said, in most of those uh, tests, it seems that Windows Media Player doesn't fare very well. So the fact that even though it is evidently not a better product, the fact that it seems to be getting so much uh, traction while all the other competitors are driven out of the market, I can only attribute it to the fact that Windows is forcing it on, computer, on, on consumers and it's not really out of, out of choice. And to me, this is a good example of following through, picking your theory of harm, proving your theory of harm. And I think these are strategic choices that um, competition authorities need to take more seriously. I'll end with this. Yes, no, this is wonderful. I mean, I could, we could go on with this discussion forever. I mean, I'm, I'm really starting to enjoy competition law, Constantinos. I mean, you said you, you, you would take the challenge to, to involve me into this. And I'm like, yes, I love it. Actually, I feel like, yeah, this is really interesting. And Elena Malikova had also um, a note on your your point is more I can about see. the yes okay so yeah. about the uh, burden of proof not only about uh, who is harmed so this is also very interesting and um, there are a couple of things about uh, pursuing the theory of harm ah, okay. I'm, I'm so sorry but i think we, we really <laughs> I know, need to there, close lot, oh yeah. my god and then we, we get even more uh, fantastic uh, helena things. helena raises some very good points including the, um, the 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 burden of proof and there there are things to say about that as, as well i know we ran out of time um, it, it's great that we have uh, had so much engagement. I know, I know this is your role to say this, but I'm really happy that so many knowledgeable people are pushing back. Um, and I think this is great because it shows that these people care about what is going on in, uh, in, in the market and in, in competition law enforcement. Um, so yeah, I mean, 
Yeah, also I see... It looks like lawyers are not going to go out of business anytime soon. No, no, no. I'm sure. This is something with a bright future, I would say. No, I'm seeing also, and I engage people to uh, have a look at the the chat also. Uh, Johanna Nula uh, is making also a a note. I would argue cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral debate is needed to understand what citizens, consumers, cannot, cannot do. I think it's really super interesting. I'm envisioning something. And Nani, who is here, Nani Jansen Reventlow, who has been the initiator of this series, I should ask you, Nani, maybe we should do something where we have two lawyers on stage. Imagine this. And I would be in the middle. I, I wouldn't even have the opportunity to ask a question, you know. We would give them a really difficult case and say right or wrong, you know. We should inquire into this. I mean, if people like the idea of having two lawyers on stage, please put it in the chat so that we know, do you like the idea? Would you like to come up on stage, you know? So just say um, something, you can say uh, yes, 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 or no, no, no in the chat if you like. I think it would be really nice to see who would like to have a debate also and make this even more lively and uh, have not two answers after the discussion, but probably a hundred, as you said, Constantinos. Thank you so much for this discussion. I mean, it was fascinating, really. And I mean, sometimes you think you say it's fascinating in a very, you know, this American way to say, oh, fascinating. I mean it. I mean it. I really, I really enjoyed it. I I'm really enjoyed myself. Useful. Yeah, yeah, totally. So thank you very much, Constantinos. Let thank me, you. Um, uh, b- before you go, let me just uh, say that uh, I've also enjoyed it very much. Um, the audience is fantastic. Um, it, it, it is a testament to, you know, the kind of people that are attracted to what um, uh, ch- charities or NGOs like DFF are, are, are doing. And I'm happy that um, obscure topics like competition and antitrust law that basically 10 years ago were not even on the curricula of law schools are now gaining a little more uh, traction. Yes, exactly. No, I think so. And I think there is even more opportunities coming up. You said with blockchain and uh, uh, cryptocurrencies coming up, and I see more, I, I think much more is coming up. I mean, when, when you enter the sphere of virtual reality, mixed reality, collection of data, which is um, even more invasive in bodies and etc. It will go into the consumer, actually. And then the role of having your own mind and your own you know, decision to make. I saw in the chat already, uh, Melissa said uh, she changed her uh, uh, her mind about what she's going to buy or something. I mean, somebody said also, I think it was Joanna, she's not buying on Amazon. I'm not buying on Amazon either. So anyway, however, thank you very much. It's great. And uh, uh, passionate speakers like you and and Neve last week, also fantastic. Thank you Um, to the ones we see less, uh, like uh, Charles, who has been setting all this, Melissa, who has been animating all the chat and pushing all the information. Save the chat before you leave, if you can. I mean, there are three dots. Save the chat so you can have all the sources we were talking about. This is really uh, interesting. You have all the uh, recommendations also of Constantinos and the Digital Freedom Fund. So save it. And um, thank you to those who have been asking, commenting, Joanna, Elena, uh, Joanna, wonderful. And um, I will see you next week. And next week, just to make a small preview, and I think she's here with us today. So this is great. Next week, we're going to go into the topic of Facebook's business model and see if Germany actually just outslow Facebook's business model. Is the case actually closed? We don't even know. So maybe we'll g- g- dig into this together with uh, Dr. Miriam, uh, Miriam Caroline Buiten. And uh, she's an assistant professor of law and economics um, at the University of St. Gallen. We are traveling around with this series. And uh, our main focuses are technology, information law, law and digitization, antitrust law. So we will dig into this uh, further next week. Same time, same place, I do believe. Yes, exactly. Um, Also 5 CET and uh, 11 uh, EST. Well, then I just have to say goodbye and uh, see you next week. Yes. Bye. Bye.